Okay. Today, November 25th, 2020, I, Maya Hill, the interviewer, will be interviewing Mr. Clark Arrington, also known as Bubba Clark, location, Zoom. Um, this oral history will be for the Black Student Alumni Oral History Project. So welcome, Bubba Clark. I am so thankful that I'm having the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I know if conditions were different, we'll be able to have the interview in person, but I'm just happy that you're taking the time to be interviewed for this project. So just to jump in, we're gonna start with background. Um, so just state where you're from and when you were born. Um, I'm from uh, Philadelphia. I was born on November 18th, 1947. So I just recently had a, a birthday. Um, and um, I, you know, I, I left Philadelphia basically uh, in ninth grade, I went away to high school. I went to a black private school known as uh, Palmer Memorial Institute in Sedalia, North Carolina. Um, and then I went to Penn State. So when I left Philadelphia in ninth grade, um, basically I, I didn't return until 2015 after uh, having lived um, a lot of places, so. So how, how was it growing up? So in your time in Philadelphia and then your transition to um, North Carolina, how were they different in, especially in a climactic sense? Like what were the differences um, maybe in community sense or maybe in schooling? Um, so would you be able to explain that? Well, you know, I, um, one of the things when you sort of live, you know, in a lot of different places and, you know, you meet people from those different places and, um, you know, and they, 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 they relate to you like, you know, this is what we do in New Orleans, or this is how we do it in Dar es Salaam, or I'm, you know, I'm from Tunisia, or, you know, in Chicago, this is how things go down. And it makes you reflect more on, well, so what, what do we do? I'm from Philly. And so um, the, I got to a point where um, I just thought, uh, and people would actually say, oh, yeah, you're from Philly? Oh, man, Philly, people from Philly are mad cool. And I'd be like, yeah, we are. <laughs> We're some of the coolest people on the planet from Philadelphia. So, um, you know, Philly, um, you know, it's, it's an old uh, African-American community. Um, du Bois wrote about it. He wrote a book called The Philadelphia Negro. So all of the, um, the elements of uh, middle-class life, uh, art, music, food, clothing, style, fashion, you know, architecture, you know, neighborhood, community, um, were reflected in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has a very large African-American community, um, very distinguished. My mother um, got her master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania uh, in 1946, um, you know, before affirmative action, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and her, 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 her girls, they were all, you know, my mother was a party girl, um, but, but she had a, a master's degree from an Ivy League school and, and her girls were all kind of party girls, uh, but highly educated and, you know, they could go to Martha's Vineyard or Atlantic City or, you know, various other places, Bermuda, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they lived that kind of life. So I grew up that, with that kind of life. Uh, um, I was just a, a middle-class black folk, black guy. And then Palmer was this very sort of elite school. Um, it was like the black prep school. And its demise was black folk being allowed, being admitted into white prep schools. So of course they didn't want to go to the black school. I mean, it was the same demise with black HBCUs. Um, from Palmer, most people went to Morehouse, they went to Spelman, they went to Fisk, they went to Hampton, uh, they went to Bennett, um, you know, they went to you know, Tuskegee, um, North Carolina Central. Um, you know, we were a feeder to those schools. Everybody went to college. And so I think I was the second graduate from Palmer to go to a white school. Um, there was a girl before me, um, she went to Michigan State. And then I went, you know, my class, I graduated in 65 and I went to Penn State. And it was really cool because I reconnected with my boys from Philly. You know, so before I went to Palmer, I was running around with some folk and, you know, and, and, and a lot of those folk ended up in Penn State. And then, you know, as you know, 
uh, well, you don't know necessarily, but um, Philly's the, the, the headquarters of Kappa, Alpha Psi. So of course, Penn State has a very strong <laughs> Kappa chapter. So all of my boys played Kappa. So we were in little gangs, you know, when I was growing up, you know, from Germantown, you know, oh, he's in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. So we, we formed another gang at Penn State but it was called Kappa Alpha Psi, and we admitted people from Pittsburgh and other places. But the core core group of Kappas at Penn State were, you know, guys I knew from Philly and were my partners, and are still my buddies to this day. Mm. So it's a beautiful uh, connection to have uh, friends that go back to, you know, seventh eighth grade. <laughs> yeah. So why did you? Why did your parents send you, was it just you or did your siblings also go to attend Palmer um, High School? If in fact you had siblings, why were you sent to North Carolina um, instead of maybe a school in Philly or a school elsewhere? I was bad. I was a bad guy. Uh, <laughs> my, only, uh, my only attribute was that I was also smart. Um, so it was kind of like either I was going to go to Central High which was, mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you had to have a certain grade point average, et cetera, et cetera, to go to Central. Um, but my mother, she was raising me as a single parent. And I think in terms of her own life, I think she felt it was challenging. Um, I think she felt it was disruptive. And I think she felt the best thing for me would be in this sort of black elite college, of, you know, uh, prep preparatory school. Palmer had a great reputation. I mean, just, you know, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was a school of black elites. So it was sort of a privilege to, to go to Palmer. There were a couple other kids from Philadelphia, um, Chews, I mean, big funeral, home family, uh, um, my friend Deidre Ferguson, um, anyway. But, um, you know, I think as a single mother, you know, who worked, um, and like I said, who was a party girl, um, you know, I think it was disruptive and challenging to raise a boy, you know, a boy, you know, it's like, oh, a little clocky, you know, when we get to be 15, 16, you know, we're no longer little clocky and, you know, we're on the streets and, you know, and I was bad. So she was, oh, don't go out. Oh, I'm going out. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so I think that was sort of her motivation. It worked out well. So when you, uh, I guess maybe your junior year or senior year of high school, you began to apply to different colleges. Was Penn State the only college that you applied to? And how did you hear about Penn State? As you mentioned, a lot of the other students applied to HBCUs. Um, so what made you want to go to Penn State and, and how did you even hear about it? Yeah, I think somebody uh, on my, my family side sort of recommended check out Penn State. But I had looked at um, Brown University, which at the time was all male. Um, Morehouse, Hampton, the kind of like the schools I looked at. Uh, and then when I heard some of the guys that I was close with from Philly were going to Penn State, it was like, oh, Penn State. And um, through some uh, organization my mother was a part of, I got like a scholarship. And, and back in the day, a state school, state schools were dirt cheap. California, they were free, but Penn State was like, I, it, it was it was like hundreds of dollars per semester. Um, now, when I when I went to Penn State, of course, I mean, in total, there were like 200 black folk out of uh, mm -hmm. 2,500 students. I mean, we all knew each other, but, but it was bottom line was that I'd heard these guys were going and somebody from my family said, oh yeah, check out Penn State. Um, so that's how I, uh, I ended up there. And at the Did time, you I wanted to be a, um, a chemical engineer. And Penn State had like a first class engineering school. Um, so it was like, you know, as opposed to Morehouse. Um, yeah. And the other, so, let me say, the <laughs> was like a black college. Mm -hmm. I mean, the social dynamics in sort of like a, you know, a fist, blah, 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 you know, you dress, who you hang out with, uh, you know, who your parents are. I mean, everybody knows everybody. And I wanted to get out of that. 
I want to like, I've done the black bougie thing. Um, I want to do, I want to, I want to sort of get lost in the crowd. And at 25,000 students, that was, I'm thinking, I, you know. And when I went to Penn State, I did not own a pair of jeans. Um, I took like, cause at, at Palmer, you wore a coat and tie every day. So my wardrobe consisted of sport coats and suits and, you know, and dress shirts um, and dress shoes. And, you know, it took me, uh, you know, a couple of weeks to realize I don't have to wear this every day. I can like put on a t-shirt, a sweatshirt and some jeans and, and I can wear them every day. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I know that's, but yeah, that was, those are the factors that led me to Penn State. So when you got to Penn State, what did you expect and were your expectations met? Um, being that there was like about 200 students, African-American students on campus at the time. Um, what was that like? What was, because going from a place of being around so many African-American individuals, young, educated African-American individuals to a smaller population, how was that transition? Uh, it was tough. Um, I started in the summer. And um, the only thing that sort of made it halfway work is that one of my friends from high school, his name was Bobby Golston um, from Shetfield, Alabama. We were, that, we were so close that he said, I'll go to summer school at Penn State just to hang out with you. So Bobby took summer classes and so I hung out with him. Otherwise I didn't know anybody. It was all white and chemical engineering kicked my butt. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, I, after that semester, I'm like, I am not planning on being a chemical engineer. Um, I was not prepared. And I do well in tests. So I tested out of, uh, I think, the, you know, the, 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 the first introductory chemical chemistry course was Chem 11, that you took a test you go to Kim 13. And I took the test, passed it, and I went to Kim 13. And that was, it was a disaster. I think I got, a, I barely got a D. I struggled to get a D. And so here's the summer, I'm studying, I'm in, everybody's out partying and drinking. And, you know, and I did my share of that, but I spent a lot of time studying. I was way behind. So it was, it was very tough. Now come the fall, I was like, oh, okay, I'm now a social science major and now black folk are, you know, hey, Clark, you know, Tico, you know. <laughs> so I, I was a cat that lived up the street from me. You know, it was one of my Philly gangs. We, we called ourselves the CBs, the Clyde and Street Boys. So there was another CB. <laughs> and he was, um, he was an upperclassman. Yeah, it was really, it was really good uh, in the fall, the summer. It was bad news. So what made you want to change your major to, uh, I guess, so you said social science, so would that be political science? I don't know what they offered at the sociology. time, but with the sociology. Oh, sociology. Yeah, I had no idea. I mean, I, 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 you know, I had no idea. Um, and somewhere in there, I, I probably didn't have to declare a major, but I was just talking to some folks because they, um, you know, it was so clients and the guy said, oh yeah. And, you know, I just was talking to this guy, Dr. Marshall Lee, and he told me to tell you that. And Marshall Lee was, a, he may have even been a grad student when, when I was an undergrad. And he turned me on to uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X, myself and several other students. And he kind of mentored us. But I started off, I, I was very familiar with Marcus Garvey because I'd learned Marcus Garvey in high school. Um, but so I was kind of like a black capitalist, uh, gung-ho, um, you know, macho man. So I was in Air Force ROTC. Um, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, and I wanted to be about the black power. Uh, and I thought the, the route to black power was through economics as opposed to politics. There was a debate during that period. Um, as to whether or not you got political power in order to get economic power to have ultimate power, or whether you got economic power 
to then secure political power that provided the ultimate power. So I, I, I thought the economic route was the route, but I, I, I didn't know, but I met Marshall and uh, Marshall radically changed me. So I, I, you know, I dropped out of Air Force ROTC um, and I, did, I really became sort of a, you know, the, the small group of people that, that sort of studied, mentored under, under, under Marshall Lee, we became the radical um, force within the black community at Penn State. Um, and uh, so I was one of those guys. So sociology, studying the behavior of groups, why not, you know? I'm just trying to stay out very, of Vietnam at this point. You, you, yeah, you, very, what'd you say? I said, you're young, you don't remember those days. Yeah. But the Vietnam I only, was like, was bad news. And you could- Yeah, I only remember that from studying it. Yeah, they could force you. I had like, you know, my boys that didn't go to Penn State, they got drafted. And many of them died, lost legs. I mean, it was, it was devastating. So every, if, if you did whatever you could do to stay out of the army at that point. Although when I did get to Penn State, I said, oh, I'll fly in it. I don't mind being a jet fighter pilot. But um, basically, if you were in college, it, it changed a lot. But being in college was an exemption from the draft. Hmm. So as you uh, change your major into to, uh, sociology, how did you begin to, or did you even um, realize the disparities that African-American students faced um, on campus? And did you experience any form of discrimination on campus that you vividly remember that kind of changed your perspective of um, your black identity in a sense of black power, um, black empowerment, and even you know advancing black people in an economic sense, as you mentioned, instead of a political sense? Well, you know, like I said, I mean, I, I mean, the autobiography of Malcolm X really kind of flipped me. And of course the civil rights movement was well mm -hmm. underway. And so was the black power movement was well underway. Um, and, and, and there were, there were activists in all, you know, all across the country. You know, there were like sort of black student activists as well as Vietnam peace activists. So college campuses were like, you know, rocking and rolling. And it was very, very obvious at Penn State with only 200 black students, you know, I mean, the state that has Pittsburgh and Philly, which are two, you know, two cities, two large urban areas with lots of black folk. But here's the state mm -hmm. college with all these resources. And it's only 200 out of 25,000. And there were no black faculty. Um, there were no books in the library. There were no courses. Um, you know, we did not really exist. I mean, other than on the football team and to some extent, the basketball team. Um, and the football players kind of, you know, Penn State, they're in their own world. They live in their own dorm, eat in their own, uh, cafeteria, I mean, they travel together and they're not part of the black community per se. So, um, you know, um, you know, I think Marshall said, you know, you guys need to sort of, you know, educate and, and radicalize your, your brothers and sisters and get in line with Malcolm and, you know, uh, Stokely Carmichael and Rap Brown and, you know, the other Martin Luther King for that matter. Um, and, um, and demand, you know, black involvement at Penn State. So that was kind of, you know, our, our role. And I helped part of this little group. Um, I noticed some, some controversy about it, but uh, we basically formed the Frederick Douglass Association. Mm -hmm. And we got it to a point where we could take it mainstream and taking it mainstream basically entailed getting the leaders in the fraternity, the black fraternity and sorority system to take the leadership, not us group of radicals. We were known as like, you know, so it had to, it could, we couldn't lead it. We couldn't bring the, you know, the Kappas and the Qs and the Alphas and the Deltas and the uh, AKAs. I mean, we were just too, too radical for that. 
But we convinced, <laughs> we basically convinced Freddie Phillips, um, mm -hmm. who was president of the K, who was poll market of campus, to be the, the leader. And at that point, we could take it mainstream. And he, he did an excellent job in uh, providing that leadership. Um, but we were the, and then I was the exceptional sort of radical. I, 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 I straddled the white radical community as well as the black radical community. Uh, so I was a Kappa, but I was also president at one point. I was a member of what was called the Jazz Club. And the Jazz Club was this crazy institution that basically started off being um, uh, a club for jazz musicians at Penn State. And at that time, there were college jazz festivals. So Villanova had one. I mean, as Michigan University of Michigan had one. Um, and, and so the jazz groups from the various colleges, you know, they'd go to the festival and you know, and there'd be uh, 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 prizes, awards uh, provided, and the musicians would get together and, you know, sort of have fun. And so that, that's how Penn State started. And um, I mean, how Penn State, how, how, the, um, how the jazz club started. But then I, somehow they got into, I guess, doing concerts. Long story short, by the time I got there, it was like the concert promoter of Penn State. And we really didn't have any faculty advisors. We weren't controlled by Penn State, except they controlled the money and we had their facility. But you know, I could write, I had a, when I was president, I had, a, I had an account at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Because so, <laughs> I didn't, you know, we had parties. We had, a, we had an apartment. We had this bomb apartment that, you know, members of the jazz club kept within. It was maybe like four or five people. There was a bar called the My, My Bar right across from Old Main. So if you cross the street, I mean, directly across from Old Main, whatever that street mm -hmm. was, there was a bar. And on top of the bar was this two-story apartment. That was the jazz club apartment. And in fact, during a freshman orientation, they would actually tell the females, like, don't go into that apartment. I mean, it was that, we were kind of notorious. Because um, we had all this money, I, mean, I, I was just reading uh, some a woman Leslie. Um, uh, <clears throat> well, I don't Leslie, I get her last name, but but Leslie wrote a book, Leslie Bat Benton, um, and she references going to a party at my apartment with uh, Janis Joplin. Because after the concerts, I'd have a, we'd have a party. Um, the mm -hmm. president. Two years before me, I guess my sophomore year, was his brother Stan Lathan. Have you heard of Stan Lathan? Yeah, he's Sanaya Lathan's father. Yeah. And he, yeah. <laughs> That's a trip. But he he is a outstanding filmmaker in his own right. I mean, um, you know, and, and and director. I mean, he's done just some really, I mean, I I, I love him for uh, Beat Street which sort of uh, mm. premiered hip hop culture before there was hip hop culture. Uh, he and Ari Belafonte did this movie Beat Street and so it was like, there was this other thing happening there. It's like, oh wow, Stan. But Stan was, was my idol, you know, at Penn State. So he was a Kappa, uh, his girlfriend, Vivian Thompson, she was the Kappa queen. And, I did exactly. So I became president. I became a Kappa. I became president of the Jazz Club, and my girlfriend became the Kappa Queen. Just <laughs> following mm -hmm. in footsteps. But what what that did was, uh, so here I was, um, you know, this kind of radical brother, um, and I had access to a lot of money mm -hmm. because we'd make a ton of money on our. I mean, the concert. I did James Brown. I mean, I did Dionne Warwick, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Duke Ellington. I mean, so we do a big concert in the beginning of the year. And then the rest of the year might, might do another big one, you know, for spring semester. But otherwise there were free concerts. They were jazz. We do a pop thing. So, you know, fill up uh, Rec Hall, 
you know, where they play basketball and, you know, so, I mean, so we made, had a lot of money. Um, so on the side, I brought Dick Gregory to Penn State, which caused a whole bunch. They're doing a presidential year um, and um, brought him up and, you know, there were some people that really pissed at, you know, oh, I'm a member of the jazz club and the jazz club is, yeah, yeah. but I had friends at the Collegian um, and particularly uh, Margie Cohen, if you ever hear this Margie, you know, I uh, appreciate all the love and care you provided me, but she could, she could always like rally the folk together to write a, a positive editorial or, you know, sort of change the facts a little bit about what had gone mm -hmm. down. Um, so they spun the Dick Gregory thing in a very, very sort of positive way. Um, but the funniest one I tell people, um, it was like uh, the SDS, Students for Democratic, uh, whatever, as whatever as society, Students for Democratic Sorry, yeah. Society. And these were like the radical white folk. Um, and um, they were, they did a newspaper. They wanted to do a newspaper and they, need a, they needed a press. So I lent them, I don't know, like $5,000, some ridiculous amount of money, or they, you know, whatever, just so they could buy a press to print their newspaper. And their first edition of the newspaper, the newspaper was called the bottom of the, of the bird cage. You know, and you know it's at the bottom of the bird cage. But, you know. That was the name of this newspaper. And their first edition, they had John Lennon and Yoko and Yoko Ono on the cover, totally naked head to toe. And that picture had been out there, but it was cut off at the waist. They used the full picture. So it was like a, you know, a vertical, you know, tabloid type. And here this picture of, of you know, I mean, showing their private parts um, on the cover of full, you know, page picture. And, um, and so, and, and they, they, they took it around. So it was on the streets. So people saw it. Next thing you know, the police, I mean, it, they snatched this paper off the, off the streets. And, and they arrested the SDS people. So then the question was, how did you guys get money to buy the press? Oh, we got it from Clark Harrington. <laughs> so again, oh yeah, well, you know, I, 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 they said well, they paid me back. Um, you know, it was just a short-term loan, and you know, <laughs> but again, there was an uproar. I mean, the frat boy, ah, you know, money's being used. Da, 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 da. But the collegian, again, you know, free press, nothing was harmed. Blah blah blah. Um, yeah, so no, I do have one that? one question about the. I have a question about um, one of the jazz events that you held in 1969. It was called the Black Weekend, um, and it was like the, one of the. I read this in a Daily Collegian. It was a small portion in the article, and it said an Afro American ensemble. There was dance, and it stated, and I quote from you: um, "You urged students to attend, all students." So I guess that, like, why? Was it so important for all students to attend these jazz events, um, especially um, with understanding and learning African American culture? Like, why was it so important for not just African American students, but also the whole student population um, at Penn State? Yeah, well, you know, I, I've never been a segregationist. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, if there's anything I think any of us are more than anxious to share. It's our culture, um, and whether we share it or not, it's we're the global. I mean, we're the culture of the globe. Um, you know, one of the things I learned about, um, you know, traveling and my adventures around the world, I, there's I've never been anywhere where the rhythm wasn't our rhythm. You know, like the music wasn't our music. Uh, Tokyo, mm -hmm. Budapest. I mean, you know, Nice. Rome, you know, <laughs> you know the, the music <laughs> and the rhythm, the pace, you know, it was it's, it's ours. We we set the, the global pace. So that's kind of our attitude at Penn, what was my attitude at Penn State. And um, 
I was uh I was must I was also on the artist series. It was like sort of a um, a university sponsored concert culture sort of program. They had a lot of resources. I think it's Swab Hall. Is there something Swab Hall? Mm -hmm. So the the would yeah. be in Swab Hall. So I helped bring um like um Alex um Alvin Alley, you know, mm -hmm. I mean that was you know me and the artist series, um, some jazz concerts. They contributed to the African American Cultural Center. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, and and and, and myself uh, at the jazz club. Uh, all my roommates were white. I lived in the the, the cap house one year, and then my last two years I lived uh, in my own apartment in the jazz club apartment. But all my roommates were white. Um, there was only one other, no, I guess there were two other black guys in the jazz club. It was a small kind of elite kind of group. Uh, it was not democratic at all. Uh, Cause nobody wanted to, they just wanted tickets to the big concerts. So that's why they became members. And the fraternity brothers, fraternity guys, they would all want to sit together. So at the beginning of the year, we're selling memberships and tickets. So if there were 50 of them, they would buy 50 memberships and then buy a hundred tickets. And they'd want that all in the same, you know, oh, no problem, you know, take care of these. And you have maybe 10 groups like that, 15 groups like that would buy, you know. So easily, you know, like a thousand tickets would just go out to a couple of fraternities, uh, not to mention me. But yeah, no, so I was always about, I mean, I met some cool people, uh, white folk. Um, you know, as well as black folk at Penn State. So we were, we were about integration. Um, I think I sent you a picture of this article in the Collegian about me taking down the, the flag. I was gonna ask you about that. This trans, so we can transition into student activism. That was in, on February 21st, 1969. Um, and the article read that it was in representation of MLK's assassination anniversary and you, it was you, Mr. Was Collins, and Malcolm X, yes. Yeah. And you, Mr. Collins and some other people taking it down. So, okay, that form of activism, what, would you consider that being radical or would you consider that just being, getting, wanting to get the administration's attention? Um, because I, I believe that this was even following after the 13 demands were made um, which we can touch on after you answer this question. Yeah, I, I don't remember Rick Collins being part of that group, um, but he may have. Because at the time, the Douglas Association was meeting in a student activity center. Um, and, and me and my boys were on the main lawn um, taking down the flag. And I guess we probably meant to take it down and then go to the meeting. But the white, some white fraternity dudes like said, no, 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 you can't take down the flag. So we had a big brawl right there. And um, the black folk didn't come to my rescue. It was the SDS, it was the radical white folk that stepped up and fought with me and Andrew and I don't know, maybe Rick was part of that group. Um, I, it wouldn't it overly surprise me. But um, I guess I just really remember Andrew um, and a couple other brothers uh, and, and the white dudes that stepped up and, and we fought off. I mean, it wasn't a, you know, I mean, it wasn't, a, but it was, it was physical. It was a pushing and punching and, you know, we wouldn't let them get close to the flag to take, to, to take it back up. Uh, and then we put a lock back on it, which meant they would have to now take that lock off. And um, part of that story is that that picture went out all over the United States, particularly in the Philadelphia and Pittsburgh newspapers. So that Sunday, I get calls from, oh, Clarky, is that you on the cover? <laughs> Yeah, you know. oh man, it was it was not good. And at the time, the president, his name was Eric Walker. Mm -hmm. He was before the state house 
uh, testifying about uh, resources. And they basically said, look, we're not gonna give you any money till you, you know, basically arrest these students who destroyed state property and are disrupting the campus, you know, and you know, me, because I'm the guy in the picture. And, um, but I knew Eric Walker. I mean, I knew the president, he knew me and he defended me. And he basically said, look, they replaced the property with a better, they tore off a lock and they replaced it with a better lock. So we didn't lose any property. And, uh, and that kind of cut, you know, so well, they didn't, you know, he couldn't say I was destroying state property. And so he got his funding and I didn't get expelled. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, I, you know, I was in some, some tricky stuff. Now, the first, our first demonstration, and the one was, uh, and it was with Eric Walker, and I loved it. Um, they, um, they, they either stopped talking to us or they did, they weren't they weren't responding to us. And so my friend um, uh, Shelly Todd, uh, she was an AKA, and she was part of our little radical group. So well, let's let's demonstrate, and um, and what we did was we uh, we built a brick wall mm -hmm. in the lobby uh, uh, the reception area of the president's office to symbolize the breakdown in communication. But we did it by the Q House was on I think it's Allen's Lane, Allen Street, mm -hmm. whatever that street is. It runs right into Old Main. Allen Street. Uh, to commercial street. So we assembled at the Q house and we gave everybody bricks. And so we marched through the city and across the campus with all these black students with bricks. And, you know, and, and, so people thought we were gonna riot. You know, like, ah, the black folks are coming, they got bricks, they're gonna start. But we, it was really well organized, myself, somebody else. We were there in the middle of the, Main uh, <clears throat> of the old main at the president's office, and so when the students came in, we would then you know assemble the bricks. So we ended up building a wall, maybe I don't know, three four feet high, but it covered the whole um, you know course of uh, all, all, the hallway, all the space. And the press conference afterwards was, you know, this is symbolic of the breakdown in communication. And that, because they were rioting all across the United States at that point, um, you know, uh, I mean, it's sporadic, but Cornell, you know, I mean, there was stuff going on. So that gave us like a lot of leverage. Like these black students are mature, they're very crafty. Um, they really made a strong point. And, and we got pretty much everything we wanted. However, you know, like I said, I stayed, I was, you know, I was engaged. The end of that next year was like none of the books that the library bought had been taken out. Very few of the courses that had been created were attended by black folk. Um, so it was kind of embarrassing that we had raised all this hell about black folk and black culture and black history. And the school finally responded, but then we didn't respond. We weren't reading those books. We weren't taking out the courses. We didn't attend the lectures. And uh, it sort of shut me up for a while. Yeah, it really shut me up for a while. Wow. So I'm going to now uh, jump to some of the more fun events at Penn State during your time, which was the Black Arts Fest in 1969. Um, I guess what what is one of your favorite memories from that time from that from that event? Um, and if you can remember, you can also give more than one. And why was that so important for? the campus and also for African-American students, just being able to showcase um, black culture on campus and show the university the, the uh, necessary need to have 
more of these events or the necessary need to have um, more African-American studies classes, programs, and other opportunities for all students. Yeah, you know, I, I really unfortunately don't remember uh, the sort of details and specifics, except um, those type of events, and particularly that, the, and certainly the Kappas, the Kappas from Howard, Kappas from the Philadelphia chapter, Kappas from Pitt, Kappas from Lincoln, Kappas from Cheney, they would descend on Penn State. So it would be like, serious party, <laughs> in addition to taking advantage of the culture. So, you know, you had a more uh, sort of traditional um, sort of black college experience. Because you can just imagine with 200 of us, everybody knew everybody. I mean, we were, you know, and everybody was basically either a, a Kappa, a Q, AKA or Delta. There were very few alphas. Uh, maybe one or two here and there. Um, and they kind of did their own thing for the most part. But everybody knew, so for other people to come on campus was like, wow, um, you know, more black folk. I mean, it was, uh, that was that was very special. But um, if there's one event I would really kind of recall that, that stood out, I mean, there are a couple, there are a couple but, but one I just for the record was, um, when we went to get Dion Warwick, you know, Penn State, the, the airport was like on top of this mountain. You had to, it was up high because, you know, it was a valley. It wasn't in the valley, so it was sort of a strip. And, um, and she flew in on a, like a two engine, you know, propeller plane. And, um, and so we'd, we'd have to, you know, we'd rent cars and we'd drive up to pick up our artists who did that for Smokey and, you know, did that for, uh, um, for Dion Warwick. And so when the plane landed, you know, we're there, it's a private thing. And so her guys get out first. And these are like a bunch of white, maybe like four white guys get out of the airplane. Um, and they kind of stand there. And, 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 and then she comes out and they help her, you know, they, you know, like sort of guide her out of the, the airplane. And I, it was it was magical. I mean, I never saw anything as as elegant and as graceful as her coming out of this airplane. And we just like, wow! It just you know like Dion Warwick. Oh my God! I mean, I'd heard her voice, maybe seen her interview, but to see her live like that was like. And 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 during the concert, and uh, you know, of course, I sit you know, front row, right on the edge. <laughs> she sneezed. She had to blow her nose. She got a standing ovation. <laughs> the whole wow. thing stood up because it was done. Like, you see, oh, excuse me, uh, you know, and she, and, and it was, you know, and I was like, wow. <laughs> the whole audience stood up and clapped. She got a standing ovation for blowing her nose. Wow. <laughs> I could tell you some other stories. <laughs> yeah, so Penn State, I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. I was very privileged. I do wanna, yeah, I do wanna make, um, ask one more question before we wrap. Well, I have other questions following this one, but um, before we get to the last part of the interview. So becoming a, cap, a Kappa, joining that brotherhood how did that shape your experience at Penn State? Um, you mentioned that you even still have some of your friends, some of your uh, brothers who are still your friends till this day, um, who you knew even as a young child. So how did that kind of shape your experience at Penn State and even your outward look on life? Um, and one more thing, I as I was watching your birthday tribute, several of your um, Kappa brothers uh, made mention of their experience and their time with you. And one of them mentioned that you and him were the, one of the first African or the only two and the first African-American waiters at the Tavern restaurant, um, which was a popular restaurant at, in State College. So just kind of talk about, um, you know, your experience and uh, your brotherhood within your fraternity. And then yeah, Kappa for we'll me, wrap up. <laughs> it's really, um, really special. Um, 
And I doubt that, um, I don't doubt, but I, 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 it's, it's unique, was unique in the sense that I joined a fraternity with guys that I was already very close with. I'd already knew them. They, you know, lived around the corner. I mean, we, you know, I knew their parents. I mean, we were already very close. And so um, joining the fraternity just solidified that. And then we're all living in the same house. Um, I lived in the cap house at one point. Um, and um, after college, and then even after graduate school, a bunch of us ended up in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was working for the SEC. The guy who, who mentioned about the tavern restaurant, he also was an attorney working for the SEC. So I, I was the first black guy to work for the tavern and it wasn't a big deal, but they, you know, it's like, I was the first guy to, you know, food was good, the tips were good, uh, you know, um, and then, so I said, hey, Raj, you know, you need a job, come on down to the tavern, Raj. So, I mean, we were the only two for at least the last two years at, at Penn State. Um, and, it was, and it was like another little club. Um, you know, the waiters at the tavern. I mean, we, we hung out together. We, you know, we occasionally have parties, but, um, you know, the food was good. The shed, the, the owners would come in in the afternoon to prepare a menu. So it was a different menu every day. So they would type up the menu. And I mean, there were some things that stayed, you know, like beef steak and the pasta that, you know, some stuff stayed on the menu, but they would cook maybe like three specials. And these guys could cook. So the food was like, <laughs> and then, you know, you're living off campus, you know, so if I'm <laughs> three, four days a week, I mean, that's three, four good meals I'm getting. Forget about the tips, but you know, I might get $10, $15 a night. $10, $15 back in the day? I mean, <laughs> what am I, you know, buying a, some wine? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I probably smoke cigarettes, you know. But but I'm just saying it was it was more than enough money. And you know, it's like a dinner was like three hours, three, four hours. Um and often, you know, I mean white folk, because we shared our tips. So whatever tips you got, they went into a pot and the maitre D and the bar tip, everybody shared the tips. Um and, and the people, the regular people who, who attended the restaurant knew that's what we did. So they would leave a tip and then they'd give me, on the side, they'd give me $10. Well, okay. <laughs> so it was a great experience. It really was a, uh, a fun experience. And uh, Rod, you know, uh, Freddie, you know, we all kind of had kids together in, uh, in Silver Spring. So, my daughter's really some of her closest friends are the children of my Kappa brothers. Um, so uh, Rod, he has two boys, um, Roddy and, and Devin. Um, uh, one son is uh, Roddy, he's like some serious musician. I mean, he's got, you know, Lamborghinis and Bugattis, I mean. <laughs> There's a funeral he lives in Atlanta. He, he flew up to the funeral in a in a private jet. You know, I mean that's that's Roddy. But he's one of my daughter's best friends because they all, you know, while we would be partying, they would be partying. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Maya Campbell. Mm -hmm. She was a uh, a TV star. I forget the the name of that show. Uh, all in the house. It was LL Cool J, it was like the big brother, and she was like the, the little big sister, uh, Maya. Mm -hmm. She's the daughter of Tico Campbell uh, and B.B. Moore Campbell. Um, and again, you know, these were, you know, Tico was an architect coming out of Penn State, he was my best friend. Um, she, she, she's not doing well um, or didn't do well. I mean, I hope she's doing much better now, but she was a big, but I'm just saying, so it's like, a, not only do we grew up on the streets and then we live together and Rod's an attorney, mm -hmm. I'm an attorney, Ray Skinner, he became uh, 
Secretary of uh, Commerce for the state of Maryland. Um, but his children, he was my college roommate. So it was not a, it, it's now generational. Um, and so their kids, our kids have having kids. Now that, there's not that mixture because our kids live all over the, the, the globe right now. But, uh, but they still come together. It's a bond that, um, you know, I'm sure it'll go on for a couple more generations. You know, I have a youngest, I have a 15 year old, could you believe it or not? Oh no, she's 16 years old, uh, my daughter. Ine, and um, I'm pointing her to Penn State, you know. Mm. She's um, training for the Olympics in swimming. Wow. Uh, for her, her host country, she has dual citizenship with Tanzania. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're, you know, we're planning on her becoming uh, uh, part of the Tanzanian swim team for the 2024 Olympics. But if nothing else, I'm like, you know, you're, with your swimming ability and she's on a roll, I want you to consider Penn State. And mm -hmm. uh, she's had a couple teachers um, who were Penn State and she really liked it. So, you know, my, my, my youngest daughter is leaning toward Penn State. So I have no animosity. Uh, you know, it was good to me. I tell her to be good to her. Uh, I went there to get lost. And although I didn't get totally lost, I did find the space to be who I wanted to be. Uh, and I had a good time in high school. I was very popular. You know, <laughs> you know, there were like, I don't know, 80 boys. And, no, there were 30 in my class. There were 30 boys and there were like 80 girls. So it was twice, you know, the ratio was two to one, um, which even for, you know, a not so good looking, a not so handsome guy like me, I could, you know, be, you know, fairly successful in, in my social life because, you know, just, uh, you know, there was a lot of demand. Um, but um, I wanted, I wanted this space. And I sense, um, you know, now she's growing up, she's going to schools that are very integrated and, you know, and so she has some space. And so she may opt to want to become more sort of Afrocentric and go to a, a Spelman or, a, you know, a Hampton or a Howard. But, um, you know, I thought Penn State was really a good experience. Um, and uh, and I, had, I had a lot of fun. Um, I had a lot of fun. My folk told me, they said, hey, um, you know, don't let college interfere with your education. And mm -hmm. I didn't let college interfere with my education. <laughs> yeah, no, because you became a very successful <laughs> individual. So I kind of want to jump as we are, you know, wrapping up. I have maybe like four more questions. Um, so one pertaining to your career, if you could kind of explain how Penn State helped you even get into law school and further your career um, as one of your, uh, I think Capra Brothers mentioned in the video as well, a black economic empowerment that you are, and then also an expert in entrepreneurship. So would you be able to briefly explain some of your experiences after Penn State and also how Penn State kind of helped you prepare for those experiences, um, being that you are also a world traveler, you went to Tanzania and some other places, um, so yeah, if you could share that briefly. <laughs> well, I would say, um, briefly that, um, I think the fact that I went to a, a black high school, I had access to, you know, I mean, a lot of literature and information. Like we had a, had a black history course in high school and our textbook was by Carter G. Woodson. Um, mm. you know, they didn't even have that at Penn State at the time. So I had, a, I had a good foundation in black history. And, and, and so part of my career, especially, you know, it, it continued through to Penn State was figuring out like, what does really, what does black empowerment really mean? Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately I, I figured it out that we have to really find a more humanistic way of doing economics and that capitalism 
you know, just didn't work for us. And, and the, you know, and I'm not anti-capitalist per se, but most of my legal career has been about creating organizations, economic organizations that, that, are, that, that operate within a value framework as opposed to do whatever thing, anything you can to maximize profits. And if it's okay to enslave someone, do that if it's legal. Um, you know, uh, and so part, I've, I've, been, I've been motivated by restructuring. And, and in part, um, I guess even before high school, but um, my parents met at a college called Talladega. My mother's from Boston, my father is from uh, Cincinnati. And Talladega was set up with the surplus funds that were raised to send the Africans who rebelled on the ship Amistad back to Sierra Leone. So they raised money and with the surplus, um, they used it to set up Talladega College. And that's where my parents met. So, I mean, theoretically, conceptually, I contemplate often that had it not been for the rebellion on the Amistad, Sin Q, um, I would not be here. That those Africans rebellion against slavery and against this extreme form of capitalism um, is what led to my existence. And so in part of my destiny is to continue that struggle. And so that's in part how I'm, I've been motivated. And um, it's been a really interesting journey. And um, I've been very fortunate. And, um, and I continue to be very fortunate. Um, I have just some really interesting clients and, you know, people, you know, you, I mean, I get these. Um, I, I have, there's, four, there's two sets of podcasts <laughs> about me. It's like, oh, and I tell people, if you're really bored, you know, check out these podcasts, you know. But um, yeah, no, so that's what's motivated me is uh, black empowerment and understanding that. And like I said, I mean, I started off with do you make the money to get the po politics or do you do the politics to make the money? Um, but then it was like, but, and now we're talking about reparations and the ultimate in reparation is repair. And the first thing you have to repair is this system. I mean, when those Boeing 637 started crashing, they paid damages to the people who died and who were, you know, damaged. But they also took that plane out of circulation and they repaired mm -hmm. that airplane before bringing it back into circulation. So part of our duty is to repair the system to show that you can survive, you can make money, you can be comfortable, you can be healthy, you can have fun but you don't have to exploit the earth. You don't have to exploit people. Um, you don't have to exploit your shareholders. Uh, you don't have to exploit your clients, your customers, your workers. Um, and, 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 and things can, can be harmonious. And so that's what I've, I've tried to do with my legal career. And I've been somewhat successful. Little, you know, uh, promotion company that I'm extremely proud of that I, you know, Upstart. I mean, I was the attorney, the capital coordinator, the chairperson of the board, equal exchange. And um, we do coffee, chocolate, uh, tea. We do a host of food products, bananas. And when I started, um, we used a for-profit framework to support the ANC, to support the Zapatistas in Mexico, Chiapas, to support the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Um, we supported uh, liberation struggles throughout the world from where we purchased coffee. We supported the co-ops that produced the coffee and we paid them you know, a working wage. We didn't pay them the market price because the market price would keep them in poverty. They wouldn't have shoes for their kids. They wouldn't have roof on their, their houses. She's like, so what does it cost to produce the coffee? And so that the coffee producer lives a decent life, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, but half the products we use in this world 
I mean, much less now than before, the people in developing countries that produce those products, they're living like, they're, they live a life of hell. They don't have health care, they don't have schools, they don't have clothing, they don't have food. You know, but we're, we're enjoying their products uh, that they make and they make them cheap, even cheaper now. And we're consumed in materialism. But so we created a model, a business model that said, yeah, you may have to pay a little bit more, but you're now supporting your values. You're now in line with what you talk. You're now eating it, you're drinking it, you're living it. Anyway, I don't wanna, but that's me, that's me. Yeah. I'm proud. You're an expert, I see. Yeah, yeah, you're uh, an expert as your uh, Capra brother mentioned, you are an expert in the field that you, you, you have um, aspired to work in. Um, so just one more question and it's gonna be two in one. It's about your college experience. So if you could summarize your college experience in one phrase, what would it be? And if you could tell your 17 year old, either 17 year old or 21 year old self something, um, what would it be? And kind of like, why would you tell yourself that? Like what advice would you give yourself? Um, the, the number one advice I'd give myself, particularly at this late age, um, advanced age was um, I needed to take uh, female, relationships much more seriously than what I took. Mm. Uh, and my commitment needed to be much stronger than what it was. But um, uh, and I prob I'm probably the type of guy that probably should have never gotten married. Um, mm. I'm married three times. I've got you know, three sets of kids and God knows how many girlfriends and uh, I've had close girlfriends. Um, so that would be my advice. And that'd be my advice to, uh, to all my young brothers out there to really take your relationships with our sisters uh, as seriously as you possibly can. And, uh, and you know, I mean, you're, you know, you're young. I mean, you know what uh, <laughs> the game is, you know, the brothers, and you go to a Penn State and here you are in a city full of young folk full of beautiful women, white, black, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the, the instinctive, uh, intrinsic desire and action of, of men is to, you know, spread seed as much as you can. Um, whereas for women, which we don't fully understand, in my understanding, is that they're looking for a very select, they want to select what seed, you know, and, and they want to be committed to that. and. Um, and so, yeah, I, I didn't play that game right. I, 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 uh, I was deceptive about what I was doing. And um, I mean, I, you know, whatever. I mean, I probably should still be married to, uh, you know, my first wife and the mother of my oldest daughter, who I met at Penn State. <laughs> but I'm not. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's sort of my, my advice. And, and I think, you know, like Stan, Stan Latham, um, he wanted to go into entertainment production. And I think at the time, particularly when I was at Penn State, we didn't think that was something possible for black folk. So the overwhelming majority of black folk during my era, we became teachers, we became health workers, uh, we became lawyers. Uh, we worked in the government. We became very traditional insurance industry. And now I would say to, to folk, you know, open up your eyes. Everything is possible. I mean, we've seen a black president. We now have a black female vice president. We've got numerous black billionaires, um, mm -hmm. surgeons. I mean, we're, we, we do everything. So take your time, figure out what works for you. And Penn State offers a tremendous amount of resources. It's well-funded, it's gonna to continue to be well-funded. Um, you know, it's, it's ample space to, to, to explore, to, to socialize. And, uh, you know, I strongly, um, I, I highly recommend uh, 
uh, Penn State, at least to be on your, your list. Uh, my, uh, my oldest daughter, she went to Brown. Um, but in part, because I was living in Providence. So she wanted to have a more closer relationship with her dad. And so Brown enabled her to do that. So, I mean, but, um, you know, I, Penn State's not for everybody, but I, I definitely recommend it. And, uh, you know, explore your opportunities as much as you think you can and develop meaningful, positive relationships with the other sex. Those are wow. <laughs> Some good gems, very important and healthy gems. Um, well, Bubba Clark, thank you so much for taking the time to be interviewed and, and share your story and your experience at Penn State with me um, and also for other people to, to listen to and watch later on. So I'm, I'm so happy that I, I got to meet you. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of what's next. <laughs> virtual hugs, yeah, <laughs> virtual hugs. But thank you so much um, for, for taking the time to do this. It, every time I think about the project, I'm kind of amazed at every individual I had the opportunity to interview um, with some of the stories and just being able to hear different perspectives and how all of you guys walked away with such tremendous, I will say, you know, I guess a, a tremendous experience from Penn State and it allowed you to propel in your careers and in and, and, and your families and in so many other places, but you have left the legacy at Penn State and I'm glad that I have been able to kind of take a part or be a part of that as a Penn State graduate myself. So thank you so much, Bubba Clark. Thank you.